Welcome to Marketing Speak, a series of interviews and monologues featuring thought leaders and industry practitioners in search engine optimization, e-commerce, and online marketing. Here's your host, Stefan Spencer, SEO expert, author, speaker, consultant, and internet entrepreneur. Do you want to learn how to create a seven-figure launch strategy for your online course, your membership site, your software as a service, your book, your product, your service? Well, if so, then this episode number 153 is for you. Today's guest is Andrew Fox, also known as Foxy. Andrew is a serial entrepreneur and supercar addict who had sold over $7 million of information, software, and membership products. His latest venture, Hyper Funnel Formula, teaches people the A to Z blueprint that he has used for many years to create all of his success. Andrew, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, Stefan. How's it going? Awesome. It's been a while since we uh, caught up, and we've met in person several times. Let's see. It was last event that we met up was uh, Greg Davis and Commerza event, right? Yeah, I think that was Washington, D.C. a few years back, maybe three years back. Yeah, yeah, I think so. So I've had Greg Davis on this podcast, by the way. Great episode. We went really deep into black hat stuff. That was a lot of fun. Before we go into kind of the meat and potatoes of this interview, I'd love to have our listeners know how you ended up with the nickname Foxy. <laughs> well, I'd like to say it's a an extravagant story, but I, I guess. My surname is Fox, and uh, it's just one of those things where people just like to add a, a Y on to the end, and you become the Foxy. Because, <laughs> yeah, you know, why not? Irresistible charm and, and all that good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. So has that been since you were a kid, or has that been more recent years? Well, I, I was actually a monkey when I was uh, about seven or eight years old, because I was always climbing on things and stairs and up trees and up roofs and stuff. Uh, maybe I always had a, a keen... Uh, natural sense of exploration. So uh, I, I was a monkey in earlier, but then I've seen I've since migrated to uh, the foxing. <laughs> awesome. All right. So you've got some amazing products, tools, services, and things that you've built up over the years. I'd love to. I would love to get into what those are and how you identified the market opportunities on that. So first, why don't you kind of give us a quick lay of the land of what the different products, services, information products, and so forth that you have currently that are available for sale now. And, and I would also include in their masterminds and events that you're running too. So what do you got? Sure, absolutely. Well, I suppose over the last three, four years, what I've really focused on, uh, staff, and again, we can get into this more in the interview, is sort of three divisions, uh, which would be info products, software creation products, and then uh, recurring uh, products all have their their pros and cons. And what I've been a, a master at, Stefan, is really a lot of the time, like, for example, uh, an info product that's done over, you know, a million dollars, I didn't create the content. A uh, software product, I'm not a developer. I, I didn't even, uh, I wasn't the guy behind creating the software. And the same with some other uh, items. So I've always been the the marketer slash the launch strategist of getting these products to market. So um, I've done that by teaming up with the right partners and, and it's worked really well. So you're the launch strategist and you're always working then with a partner who's handling sourcing the, the programmers and dreaming up what the infrastructure is and the architecture of the product and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you a few real life examples. So um, obviously, I work with um, my uh, brother, Chris. You know, Chris, um, he, he's not a developer per se, but he's always had a natural talent of looking in the right places to hire developers and programmers. I kind of get his ideas and concepts into into real life. So what would happen, uh, just to give you a kind of real life story, I think your listeners will appreciate this. You know, back around, must have been 2012, 13. We could see that there was a market sort of for WordPress plugins, which would obviously, you know, you just put it on your WordPress site and it will perform a function, which would save you uh, doing a labor intensive task. And to get more specific, for example, we had one called uh, Content Gorilla. And what this did was you could put it on your WordPress site. Basically, it would pull content from the Amazon catalog 
and place it on your site automatically. You would also have your affiliate link embedded. So say, for example, you would put in the keyword Tiger Woods if your WordPress site was about golf. It would then automatically scrape the Amazon API and would basically pull content relevant to that and would automatically display it on your website. So uh, what was good about this, Stefan, was obviously as Amazon updated their catalog, the plugin, you know, the software would auto update on your website. So again, that's an example of replacing, you know, labor cost with using technology to solve a problem. We sold these plugins from anywhere from $27 to $37. And then we would have a various upsells, i.e., would you like to use this on one website or would you like to use it on 10 websites or unlimited websites? Uh, then we would maybe offer some training. Here's how to get more visitors to your WordPress website example. So you're always thinking of when someone comes to your website, that's only part one of the process. Uh, once they become a customer, what else can I add value on? What other services would they need? Just like Apple, for example, uh, you buy a, an iPhone, then they'll sell you an Apple TV. Then you'll buy like a, an Apple MacBook. You know, it's a real indoctrination into the brand. And I, I think in a lot of cases that for any real successful business, acquiring customers is the most difficult and the most expensive part. But, you know, you've, you've got a lot of competition out there. Uh, you have to get people to know, like, and trust you. But as soon as the transaction is made, and as, as long as you look after your customers, then you've got a really solid business that you can pivot from. You know, you can always survey them. What else would you like to see? What other product or services can we help you with? And um, I've always found that a great indicator to help springboard to the next project. Yeah, yeah. So is it a viable business to have, let's say, a WordPress plugin or some sort of browser extension or something that only sells for 20 bucks? Can you build a seven-figure business or a seven-figure launch out of a small product like that? If done right, you absolutely can. But to really hit into higher six figures and seven figures, typically anytime I've achieved these numbers, it's probably been where there is at least a mid-ticket range. And we'll define mid-ticket as 297 to 497 and then higher ticket is 997 to $2,000. If you want to hit those larger numbers, typically getting a higher price point is going to make that goal uh, more realistic. But but to get people into your initial funnel, Stefan, maybe get a bit of traction immediately. The lower price point can be a, an easier sell. So give us an example of a mid-ticket uh, item that you're selling. Okay, so with Zappable, we sell that for $497 per year. Uh, Zappable is a, is a mobile app builder, like a drag and drop interface. So to kind of break this down, make it easy for people, obviously, a lot of people on this call will maybe heard of Wix.com or Squarespace.com, which obviously is a DIY website builder. So we basically created a, a Wix of apps where you could just create apps, you know, no development experience. Just log into like a online interface, create an app from scratch. But what we did, Stefan, was we targeted the business opportunity market with it. So we targeted either people who were looking to get into a business opportunity, i.e. they could see the explosion of mobile apps. They knew that this was a good business to be getting into or people who had a, you know, say, for example, uh, you know, you, you did SEO for a while. Well, a lot of clients, uh, you know, do search engine optimization for the chance are, do they need an app? Well, probably it's an app's going to become almost as as essential as a website. So we would also target people who had existing, you know, digital marketing agencies and things like that there. So that was an example of a, of a mid ticket item. And just to kind of go into the funnel process as well, we used. We obviously had the, the actual app builder software, but then what we did was we said, hey, look, you have the app builder. You basically can build apps with that, and that's fantastic. However, um, do you have videos to approach uh, businesses in different niches, i.e. real estate, nightclubs, local doctors? Do you have landing pages? Uh, do you have, like, email scripts? Do you have, uh, you know, confidence to approach these businesses? And a lot of people would say, well, no, Andrew, yeah, we don't. So what we did, Stefan, was we created a, an add-on called a Zappable Agency which give these uh, give our customers a done-for-you um, service. We released that for the first time in November 2017, I believe. And I think we sold around $80,000, which was just to our own customer list, which was a great start. 
And since then, we've obviously had well over six figures with Zappable Agency. Again, just to show people what we're doing is once they join Zappable Agency, we'd say, hey, you've joined Zappable Agency. You know, you've got the done for you videos. That's great. But would you like a new done for you video in a niche voted for by you every month? Click here to get in with a low monthly fee. And we give people a 30-day trial to that, Stefan. The, the stick rate has been incredible. And we currently charge at least around $49 per month for that service. And, and people love it. So again, it's an example of once people like your brand, they bought the app builder. Then they bought the Zappable agency package, which was about another $500. And then they're paying an extra $50 for one new video a month. So it's always an example of get the customer in, get them to know, like, and trust you, and then sell them additional products and services, which create additional value to their businesses. Yeah, yeah, that's a great model. And you also have very high ticket offers as well, like you have a, a mastermind. Um, how much does that one cost? Well, the masterminds that we have hosted in the past have ranged anywhere from $5,000 up to $25,000. The high ticket one is an event I put on uh, with uh, Peter Parks, who yeah, Peter is a, uh, is a fantastic paid advertising and, and general business kind of general. Also a, a very good dude. This is where we actually took a group of people, just a small select group of entrepreneurs, uh, generally doing pretty well. We would take about maybe eight people on maximum, possibly 10, just depends. And uh, we would take them on board my yacht for three days. What we wanted to do to ensure that they got ROI back, because it's always about return on investment. Uh, you're not just, if you're a business guy, you're not going to pay $25,000 just to go hang out. Yeah. Even if it's on a yacht. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, some people, we, when we got there, Stefan, the funny thing was that it was like we went out for dinner at one of the nights at a lovely restaurant and everyone's getting in the groove. And uh, they're like, Foxy, let, let's go out. Let's hit the town. And I'm like, no, no way, guys. It's one o'clock. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but it'll be good. And I said, <laughs> laughing, going, you guys have paid me 25 grand. And as much as I'd like to party with you, I have a job to deliver to you. <laughs> so my, my own attendees were trying to drag me out to, to get a bit wild and crazy. So we generally do that in the last night. But for the next two to three days, is we, we got to deliver good value. So <laughs> it's a funny story, though. Yeah. Well, you got to deliver massive value to yeah, get an ROI on a $25,000 weekend. That's uh, that's pretty incredible. So what would, do you have an example of somebody who got massive ROI from that weekend? Yeah, I, I mean, the best way I could give examples are uh, I still speak to a lot of um, past attendees from events, and uh, they've left very, very powerful testimonials. Uh, if you go over to gofoxy.com, um, there, there's probably a, a bunch of them over there. Just people uh, who've been in, again, business opportunity. Another, there was a few people in like the t-shirt business. Again, they did really well. Another was in the, the travel niche. Again, his business um, got really, really good results. Um, sorry, I can't drop websites and URLs, but obviously it's kind of client privacy. So some of them like to kind of keep their websites to themselves. But a lot of good testimonials on the website. So the answer to that is absolutely yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and so what might be a typical ROI for somebody who who spends twenty five grand with you for a mastermind? Are, are they going to make six figures out of that? Are they going to make seven figures? Well, let me answer this as in: if you came to me, Steph, and you said, "Hey, look, I'm brand new to the internet business," and, and this does happen, uh, people who come out of ex corporates, you know, they have a you know maybe a, a payoff. They're looking to invest. They want to get into the internet business and, and they are willing to pay, you know, um, significant sums of money. If you came to me now and said, Andrew, I'm going to give you 25,000. I'm new. Do you have a program for me? I would say, I'm sorry, Stefan, not at the moment. It's a lot easier to tune something that is already making money and look for the gaps in the holes or maybe they're missing something like their mindset isn't right or they're doing something that's blocking them from scaling to the next level. So, we find that with a lot of our attendees, they were typically generating uh, high six figures into seven figures in revenue. Profits were in the in the healthy six figures. So it's a lot easier to adjust a business that's already making money and making profits uh, than it is to um, you know take someone from a standing start. A good comparison would be it's like someone learns wants to be a, a great boxer, but they walk into a gym and they say, "Hey, if, uh, how many?" boxing lessons have you had or how many fights have you had and they're like zero it's going to be a lot harder to uh, train that person from someone who's actually uh, had a bit of experience yeah that makes total sense 
So let's say that somebody has made high six figures in their business and they want to finally break into the seven figures, maybe even multiple seven figures. And let's say that they're missing some key components. Let's say they're missing a chief operations officer or a launch strategist or a great sales copywriter or something like that. Do you make the introductions? You hook them up with those people? Do you teach them how to become a great sales copywriter themselves? What is, what's the next step to get to the next level for them? Again, first of all, we'd look at their business. And, and the first thing that we'd like to do, um, I always find it very helpful, is I basically say, okay, let me see what your business is about. How are you making money right now? And they'll say, well, I'm, I'm driving traffic from affiliates. We're doing some Facebook. Uh, we're doing some Google AdWords. We're on YouTube. And I'll say, well, and what are you having the most success from? then we'll break down their numbers and we'll basically see where their leverage points are. For example, if they're on Facebook, could they be expanding into other audiences or could they be scaling up their their audiences where they are? If they're getting great ROI from another another vertical or sorry, another advertising source, should they maybe look into expanding that? It's what I find definitely with people is people are, this is as a natural human tendency, I'll actually tell you a story from a tech hub in Miami. Uh, so we were in at Miami at this uh, tech convention. There was a couple of people that had been funded a few hundred thousand dollars as a seed round. It was for a, it was for I think it was an intercompany survey app. I think the fee was around twenty. It was a thirty day free trial and then twenty five dollars a month. And they said, well, we're advertising on Twitter. We're actually getting. We're getting a customer acquired for about $5. And I said, that, that's fantastic. And I said, and what percentage convert into $25 a month? And they said, oh, about, about 50%. So I'm like, so for the first month, even at $25, if, if 50% convert, you're getting $12 back. And the company was relatively new, so we didn't know what the stick rate was, i.e. how long they, they stayed. But you know, let's say, we'll call it a number, say five months. So five times 12 would, or five times $25 would be, $125. So for a $5 investment, that could turn out pretty well. So I said, okay, that's fantastic. Are you scaling that up? Are you increasing the traffic? No, no, we're, we're going to Facebook. I'm like, well, have you, and, and this is a bootstrap company. So it's not like they have lots of finances to burn. They losing money. They're burning through like a lot of money each month. Um, but they've got it. They've got a way to, you know, start generating more positive cash flow. And I said, why, why don't you just expand Twitter? You've got that working. Why don't you just uh, scale that up, exhaust that avenue first before you start venturing off into uh, new advertising mediums? And they kind of look at you with three heads and they're like, I suppose we never thought about it like that, but we just want to try. And this is the thing, especially with technical people, Stefan, is they just want to like try new things and, you know, they want to poke and fidget. Sometimes that's not the best path to success, especially if you're in a tech company that's burning, you know, 20, 30 grand a month. And the answer is there right in front of them. But sometimes they can't just see the thing that's always in front of them. It's, it's so funny. It's just a, a natural human tendency, especially with creative people. Uh, that's a great example. And uh, did you keep in touch with the, those guys? I haven't kept in touch with them specifically, but I would. Um, I think I looked at their website about three months ago when it was operational. So they're, they're, they're still um, being funded or, they're, or they're maybe they're profitable by, by now. I'm not sure. So let's talk a little bit about this arrangement you have with Peter Parks, uh, who's also a fantastic marketer and, and technologist. I met him at the event to or several events where you were also present. So you guys have this DNA wealth blueprint together. Could you describe what that is and what the business model is? Yeah, absolutely. I'll even tell you a bit of background in this because sometimes people ask me, how do you meet content providers? How do you team up with people? Basically, I released a guide. It was in about 2007, I believe, called the, the Guru Slayer. And effectively, it told you it was a bit of marketing hype, you know, how to beat the gurus at their own uh, game, classic us against them uh, sort of mentality. And effectively, it, w- it would teach email marketing, the psychology behind it, the difference between prospect lists and buyer lists. And uh, Peter actually was one of my customers, not that I knew about it at the time. So I got a testimonial about two or three years after that saying oh hey man uh, my name's peter i'm not sure if you know me uh, peter would have been quite behind the scenes too he would have been very uh, public but he said you know i just I bought a house in canada it was like half a million dollars i've paid for it in cash 
And I just wanted to say a big thank you to you, bro, because you were one of the guys that helped me achieve my big breakthrough. I think you mentored myself and Frank Kern. So I wrote back and I said, dude, that's awesome. Thanks so much for connecting. You know, it sounds like you've done amazing. So Peter had basically taken my meals, my style, and he'd understand. That was the first kind of course that that gave him an insight into email copywriting. And in fact, uh, James Shamaranko as well, on a recent podcast, he actually gave me credit for that too. So it obviously had impact on a lot of people. But the point is, Stefan, that that forges relationships. So when you put out great value and great content, it always seems to come back on you. So fast forward three, four, five years, I think uh, around 2013, maybe, I'm in uh, Cancun, Mexico. Peter hits me up and he goes, hey, Foxy, uh, what are you up to down there? And I'm like, oh, I'm just uh, doing a bit of work, uh, meeting a few clients and just uh, having a, enjoying the lifestyle. And he goes, well, you want to come up to Canada, bro? And I'm like, well, what temperature is it there? You know, Cancun's like 80 degrees. It's like warm and sunny. Like, like why do I want to leave there? <laughs> I have to, I have to get the cold too. So Peter's like, well, uh, come up to Canada and I'll pick you up and all. And we'll, we can chill out and work. And I'm like, like dude, it's like minus six degrees or something. Like, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> And he's like, you know, I turn down conferences all the time that are in the middle of winter and freezing cold climates. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty spoiled like, that way, too. Yeah, like there's an event in uh, Portugal this year. And because I live in the UK, um, even though I do travel a lot, uh, the fact that it's in Portugal and the weather was great last year, like I'll probably go to it this year. And that's because of its uh, of its location. <laughs> so it's funny. Anyway, uh, Peter uh, says to me, well, dude, uh, how about uh, I'm doing like over 100 grand a day with Facebook? And I'm like, mmm, what? <laughs> Most people would think these are quite absurd claims. But, but I've known Peter for, bear in mind, like six years at this point. And he's, he's a pretty straight shooter. So he was generating massive ROIs uh, on Facebook, uh, you know, using Facebook as the app, a traffic source, driving people to uh, CPA offers, which is cost per acquisition. So example, you know, like things like, teeth whitening or you know skin care weight loss pill, pills things like that there where the advertiser will obviously pay you a commission for for any leads you refer them and obviously peter was doing this on a, on a mass scale uh, you don't get to those numbers without a, a good team and structure and an organizational brain so he was fantastic at that so when someone makes that offer staff and you're thinking mm, this is pretty intriguing so i get on the plane land in uh, canada it's freezing uh, Peter's like in this big duffel coat and stuff. And uh, he's like, welcome to Canada, bro. We went to his house and hung out. And, you know, he just took me through some of his numbers. He was doing, you know, amazing things. And uh, he's like, you think people would want to learn about this? <laughs> well, I'm like, well, yeah. And, and basically, th- this was the challenge we had, Stefan, is if you try to put out on the internet, right? And, and bear in mind, Peter wasn't that really that public. If you try to put out that you're you're hitting a peak of $100,000 a day. Now, that's revenue as well, okay? But obviously, the, the profits were pretty pretty eye-opening. Making those claims, most people are going to like say, that's nonsense, that's rubbish. Um, so one of our biggest challenges was how to basically break this down into achievable numbers. And, and again, this was my job. Peter was the content provider. I was the launch strategist. I was handling the, you know, the email swipes, the creating the sales copy. So it was quite a tricky product. So what we decided to do was everyone was selling products and teaching about Facebook advertising. And most really weren't that good. There were a lot of copycats, some good courses out there, but for every one good one, there was kind of four or five mediocre and maybe five copycats. So what we decided to do was we priced at a, at $2,000. Ours was a much higher premium product and, and we wanted to attract premium. So we charged $2,000 and we were up front with people saying, they go, do we need any additional costs? And we're like, well, you're probably going to need a, a $30 to $50 a day advertising budget over 30 days because effectively you're going to be paying for advertising. You're going to be acquiring data and analyzing that data and, and seeing um, you know, where, the, where they're biting. So effectively, you know, people were going to need $3,500 up front. And we were pretty honest with people. Because obviously selling is one thing, Stefan, but if you sell to people who want to get rich quick, wanted to buy this type of product, it wasn't going to work. We then lined up some great partners. You're asking about the business model at the start of this question. Again, just from networking and and knowing the people in the space and having met Greg Davis at the event, Greg was another uh, really good CPA marketer. So I actually introduced Peter and Greg together. Um, Obviously, they had a lot of synergy and stuff. 
And I said, Greg, look, would you be interested in promoting our course? I think your listeners would really like it. And you know, Greg's fussy. He's not going to promote something that, that doesn't deliver value, especially in that niche, because, again, there's some very bad training out there. But, but he knew Peter was, was on the level. So, again, long story short, Greg promoted that product, $2,000 each. And I think he, he sold over $70,000 the first time around. And over the coming years, we released, you know, different versions and updates. And I think I need to go check the stats, but Greg has probably sold around a quarter of a million dollars in revenue for us. So shout out to my man, Greg Davis. Uh, he's a great guy. But, but that's the part of just one good product and uh, one, one great super affiliate. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, Greg, Greg's a good guy. He uh, puts his marketing power behind your product. You're pretty well set. So uh, did, did you have other marketing partners that were big like Greg, or was Greg your, your main powerhouse there? Greg was our main powerhouse, but we did target other uh, partners. But it was a very specific partner um, where people – you can't just send an email to your list, like Stefan, if you just emailed your list and said, hey, here's a product, uh, go buy it, it's really good, and it's a couple of thousand dollars, that's not going to swing it. You're going to have to commit to the promotion, so you're going to have to you know, warm people up with, uh, you know, we created some pre-launch content, um, which again is my job as the launch strategist, so we, we created a, a bit of teaser content for pre-launch video one, then pre-launch video two, we had a live launch webinar. Any partners that basically got involved, they would also promote that as well and, and warm up their lists. So what we focused on was quality of partners rather than quantity. If you're doing a launch, going back to the start of the call, and you're selling like a, a $27 product, that's got a much more broad market appeal because it's it's a much more of a, an impulse purchase because, you know, it's 27 bucks. It's, it's not too bad. But when there's $2,000 involved... And um, people will still buy, absolutely, but they need to be warmed up accordingly, and you need to be targeting your audience um, with a, a lot greater precision. Yep, yep. So, were you using product launch formula as your formula for doing the launch, or some other program? I sort of had figured most of this stuff out myself inadvertently. I mean, I've been doing, I suppose, and when I use the word launches. You know, since probably 2002, 2003, this is when I was building up a product, building up anticipation and then releasing it. At the time, Stefan, I wasn't even aware I was doing a launch. I was just kind of like releasing the product and they, they seemed to do pretty well. So I actually re released my own. Um, it, it wasn't anywhere near as in-depth as Jeff's. By the way, I know Jeff Walker well. He's a fantastic guy. He, he actually came out on the, uh, on the yacht with me uh, in 2005 in the south of France. And we interviewed him there. It was it was great times, good memories. But I actually brought up my own version, launcherproduct.com, which it's passed now, it's gone. But I think that was, I can't even remember, must have been 04, 05. <laughs> yep. So I just figured, figured this stuff out myself. But launching a product is a is a massive evolving marketplace. E email is still king, but with uh, social on the rise, Instagram, Insta stories, and, and also messenger bots are, I mean, the deliverability and the opens and clicks on messenger bots is phenomenal at the minute. I'm, I'm really, really enjoying experimenting with that. Are you using ManyChat or are you using some other messenger bots? Yeah, I've just used ManyChat. And I'll be honest, I haven't tried out other bots because ManyChat is definitely a company that are, are growing and they're always changing features. They're, they're on top of it. it. It does what it says in the team. They have a good Facebook community. I'm still not anywhere near the limit of its potential. So I actually have a a guest on my own show coming up soon called Philip uh, Couture, a messenger marketing expert. He's, uh, he's producing some really good um, PDF flows in that. So uh, shout out to Philip as well. I'm looking forward to getting him on the call. And Yeah, I've had uh, Mickey L. Yang, the CEO of ManyChat, on this podcast. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, ManyChat looks great, and, and they're very much in their infancy. I mean, Stefan, I, I honestly see that conversational marketing is, is going to be colossal. It, it's probably, it's going to be one of the biggest marketing mediums in the next five years for sure. Back in the day, when text messages were, were released, I said, this is the way people are going to date. And this is the way people are going to communicate with each other. And, and that's that's what happened. And I'm now predicting that like conversational marketing, even for example, I, I was getting a, a cleaner for my house and I went on Facebook. I contacted them via the messenger bot, which had a few preset replies. I, you know, what are your rates? What services do you offer? Different things. And, and that's how we did the whole transaction. And it's only a matter of time before mass adoption occurs. And 
you can just pay for it online. So you'll be able to book it on Messenger. And I know you can do this now, but it's not, it's from what I've seen, it's it's not had mass adoption yet, but it's certainly going that way. It's, it's the same with Apple Pay and Android Pay as well. I now leave the house a lot of the time with not even a wallet. I just use Apple Pay to pay for everything. So it's certainly the way I think the world is heading. I'd like to actually turn that question on you um, because you're obviously pretty technically savvy. Do you think that um, things like Apple Pay, Android Pay, conversational marketing, what do you see in the future for those? Oh, yeah, I see they're they're huge. And also I'm very bullish about blockchain and bullish about AI. Yeah, there's just a lot of really cool stuff coming. And an analogy that I think is very powerful for people to recognize is that the speed of things is not linear. Like if you look back 100 years into the past and think, okay, what was going on 100 years ago for people? What technology did they have? What was the speed of of technology advancing and adoption of those technologies and so forth? The At the speed that technology was advancing 100 years ago in comparison to today you could uh, the last uh, you could fit the next 20 years into the last 100 years because it's so much faster now with uh, Moore's law Metcalf's law and so forth the law of accelerating returns and then if, when you consider that we're continuing to speed up it's not staying stagnant. It's not actually 20 years would fit into the, the last 100 years of technology advances would fit into the next 20 years. No, it would be the next 12. This is according to Ray Kurzweil, who's one of the most accurate predicting futurists in the world. He's now working at Google. He co-founded Singularity University. He's just a brilliant, brilliant guy. So imagine thinking like, okay, what's going to happen in the next five years? What do I need to do to future-proof my business? Should I be investing in many chat? Should I be doing this, that, and the other thing? It's like you can't possibly keep up because you're thinking linearly like five years. Okay, that was kind of like the last five years, but it's not. It's nothing like the last five years. It's all new, and it's speeding up at a faster and faster clip, like beyond yeah. our ability to really wrap our heads around it. So we need yeah. to not just think about things like conversational marketing and so forth. We need to start thinking about nanotechnology. And artificial general int- uh, general artificial intelligence, which is the AI at the level where it can actually outthink us and not just expert system sort of scenarios with specific small use cases, but just generally pretty crazy world we're living in. <laughs> I love this, Stefan. I'm going to give someone some ways. Uh, if they want some nuggets on how to get rich, <laughs> I'll show how to tap into this, how to how to kind of turn the tide and, and make it your friend. Because first of all, this, this is a great conversation. I mean, we could talk for hours in this alone, but the word exponential and not linear is, is so correct. This isn't just, by the way, an online marketing. This is what's happening in your world. I mean, look at the advances. And let's just talk about a few things very quickly. And then I'll, I'll go into these nuggets of how to kind of tap into this the, the right way. Look at the way cars are evolving, you know, electric cars and, and simple things from like, you can book your car in from a service from your smartphone. You can see how much fuel it's got. You can check if the doors are locked. Uh, you know, home technology, home automation, you know, turn your lights on, turn your lights off, uh, wireless doorbells. Look at even if you go to look at kitchens now, they can uh, detect what type of food it is. It can steam your food to the perfect level. It can detect moisture levels. As you say, the, the linear thinking, it doesn't apply. And sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. So, what we've learned, Stefan, is to circle back and give some people some gold nuggets is, is it going to be hard to create things like, and, and especially these companies like, you know, Instagram and Facebook and Google, you know, with basically infinite resources, you know, Apple's now a, a trillion dollar company. What you need to do is to try and compete with these companies ever is going to be hard. But where your advantage lies is they are paving the way. And they also allow some really good APIs, which is obviously how you connect to their websites. So what we are doing now, as you say, to future proof is, okay, and, and I'll tell you some of the lessons we, we personally learned from running our own businesses where when, when we were actually building out Zappable, uh, we built in our own appointment scheduler and stuff. The sheer involvement of, of uh, keeping that system up to date the, and basically keeping on top of it and the maintenance w- w- was horrible it, it was just a, a complete pain so we've now learned when 
we basically um, alter our system or go on to, you know, we will change on the new tech stack eventually. We will basically tap into other systems, you know, like schedule once Acuity or even like Google, because our job as an app builder isn't to basically have all the features contained in app built from ourselves. Our job is to be the connector. So if you can start thinking about how you can actually build software that integrates and pulls data from APIs, just like the WordPress days where you were pulling data from Amazon and stuff, Amazon are just going to expand as a catalog. They're only going to get bigger. They're only going to get better. It's the same as, you know, things like scheduling softwares, payment systems. For you to build your own version of that is going to be very resource heavy, and it's probably not going to be nowhere near as good as other systems out there. So, but to link in via API into these systems and be and be an integrator is a much more valuable way to future proof your business. There's no such thing as guaranteed, but I see that as one of the greatest ways to kind of protect yourself and also just to evolve with the times. I hope that made sense there. Yep. Yeah, it sure does. And another tip is to find two areas that are quite different from each other and integrate those two areas together. So let's say that you're very good at, I don't know, painting, watercolors, and you're also very good at machine learning, or you're very good at system administration. Find ways where you can can integrate those two very different disciplines together, because that's going to be very hard, any kind of AI to replace you. Right? We're, we're all going to get replaced by robots. <laughs> It's just a matter of when, and your job is going to be career, your your business is going to be a lot safer for a longer period of time if you bring together very creative disciplines that are hard for an AI to replicate and, and will be in years to come, especially if you intersect between these two very different creative disciplines that are tough for an AI. Well, I'm going to go in the line there and say, yes, absolutely, robots are going to are going to replace a lot of jobs but what you cannot replace is is the natural human touch and that humans naturally always want to be part of a community they want to have something that's special and that's why i believe certain things like um obviously i i've owned several supercars and um quite a big porsche um, fanatic and stuff i think that the more rare and the more like someone says well what happens if your car you can't run on fuel anymore and i go that's okay it'll be worth more and they're like you're crazy I said, no, it won't. Because if you have certain models, the less we have, the more something, the more harder to reach it is, i.e., who would buy a car if you couldn't buy gas for it? It was really awkward to get. I'll tell you who'll buy the car. The people who can afford it, the people who want exclusivity, like, oh, yeah, I have this car and no one else has it. It's a it's a 1986 Porsche Turbo, last of the water cold and all this kind of stuff. So it's the same way as in collecting a a very fine piece of art or something like that there or Going to a restaurant where you can almost buck the trend where you can say like, uh, you know, you'll never get this experience online or something. You know, you've got to think outside the box, Stefan, because a lot of jobs like, you know, say like McDonald's or the the taxi industry, things like that. I 100 percent agree. There's only so much you can do to protect yourself and something like that. You're going to need to learn a new skill set. But there's certain jobs, I think, and brand identity that people will always gravitate to. But for a lot of jobs, it can be systemized. Absolutely. But but some industries you can actually use technology against yourself and turn it on its head. Yeah, well, we'll see how things play out. But uh, <laughs> I think it's going to be a brave new world when AGI, artificial general intelligence, really kicks into gear and uh, artificial entities will be able to write symphonies and paint masterpieces that are as creative and amazing as Picasso and Rembrandt and so forth. And it's coming. It will be here. So that'll be an interesting time, and uh, that's why the singularity is such a, a scary, a mysterious thing, is because there's there's no way to predict it, right? no way to predict a, a singularity event, whether it's a, a quantum singularity, a black hole, you don't know what the, like the, all the known laws of physics break down inside of a black hole, but also all the known laws of evolution break down when you get to an evolutionary singularity, which is what we're going to hit in about 2065, according to Ray Kurzweil. So interesting times. For many of us, it'll be during our lifetimes, at least hopefully, knock on wood. And yeah, I, I always keep the long view in mind when I'm working on stuff, not just like what's five, 10 years out, but what's what's coming in the next 30 years. Yeah. Let me go back to this stuff, and this is interesting. So 
I'm agreeing with a lot of what you're saying and stuff, but if I was to teach people some investment advice and again, going against the natural grain of thought, I'll, I'll give you some real life examples. So in 2005, Ferrari uh, had, they brought out the Formula One gearbox, you know, the paddle shift. Uh, no, sorry, they brought it out around 2001. And oh, no, sorry, they'd actually brought it out a bit earlier. But in 2005, the F1 gearbox and the Ferrari F430 was hailed to be one of the true F1 boxes, i.e. the other ones were a bit clunky and they didn't change gear right and everything, but the F430 was the first one to do that. So in 2005, what percentage of people do you think ordered the Formula One gearbox versus the open-gated manual gearbox? I have no idea. <laughs> I would say probably around 85 90% ordered the F1 gearbox, okay? The manual was disgusting. Ooh, who would order a manual? Why would you want one of these disgusting things? I don't have a manual. So five years on, a uh, recession hits, a uh, worldwide recession. Uh, Ferraris, and you know, everything goes down in value. Ferrari 430 manuals are probably sitting around, back then, around £45,000, okay? So fast forward eight years, okay? Now, the car market in general has went up, especially supercars, has actually has grown a lot um, since then. Again, we, we'll get on to that in a, a different, we could speak about that for hours. But now in 2018, Stefan, what price, if a manual 430 was, say, 45000 and an F1 430 was 55000 what price do you think they are eight years later? Well, let's see. I have no idea. <laughs> well... The Formula One uh, version will probably start at around seventy-five to eighty thousand pounds. So you know it's up from around fifty-five. But the manual ones with a with a decent mileage, they are now instead of being forty-five thousand, they're about a hundred and twenty, a hundred and thirty thousand pounds. Uh, because so, they're more, uh, they're rarer. Yeah, and at the time it was like, oh, this is who wants that? Who would buy a manual? That's old school. That's that. But now old school is the more popular. So this will happen. When the rise of the robots comes and, and all the AI, it will still be the stuff that is desirable, that the stuff that you're buying, that maybe technology will replace this, but I think this is actually going to be more desirable. Mm. Yeah, I, it, I could see it, that. I can see that. So it's, it's interesting. So there's a bit of investment advice for someone. Don't doubt the rise in machines, but if you think there's something that could, because it's original, trust me, people will pay for originals and things that are different from everyone else every, every single time. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, like you're, you're really into supercars and I'm not at all. Like I, I, you were speaking Greek there to me, all that. Uh, And that's cool. I mean, I, I, I like that you're passionate about something. For me, I'm more passionate about experiences than about nice cars. I am going to be getting a a Tesla here in the next couple months. Uh, It's on order. It's being built right now. And and that's nice, but I'm, much, much more excited about, like, I had a trip to Egypt a couple months ago with my wife, and I flew in two of my three daughters from the U.S., and we had an amazing time. We spent 12 days, Nile cruise. We saw everything. We went inside pyramids. We went inside of these exclusive, you know, tombs and stuff that hardly anybody gets to see. And it was amazing. It was incredible. Um, this week, I'm going to Romania. Uh, about f- three, four weeks ago, we went to Copenhagen. I'm big into that. I'd much rather spend discretionary money on experiences than, than on nice cars. What's your take on, like, for the average listener who's who's listening and they need to be smart with their money, but they also want to live a little too, what, what advice would you give them about this whole thing? If you're trying to strike a balance, uh, again, what what I probably do, and and touching on experiences and supercars, I mean that's great that you do it that way. I mean I don't, I still do. Uh, I travel, not as many different countries and things like that, but I I believe changing your environment and meeting different people and stuff is essential to your growth as a person and also in life and business in general. But my advice would be this: to try and get ahead, and say you want to, you know, the average listener wants to grow and get ahead. Look at some business conferences in your area related to your task. I say you're a painter or you want to learn how to get into online business or you're, you know, you're passionate about technology or maybe you want to you know, start a technology company from scratch. Um, look around some conferences so you can actually you know, get a bit of education as well as getting a bit of lifestyle about the place too. Honestly, Stefan, I'm, I'm a bit of a kind of crazy driven entrepreneur. So if people just say to me like, hey, 
why don't you take off for two weeks to some super luxury holiday and basically lie in your bum and not do anything for 14 days? I'd probably go insane. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always looking at, yeah, well, I'll I'll maybe go to, you know, Miami and I got friends there and, you know, we'll hang out for a few days, kind of business friends as well, because kind of business is my passion as well. Then I'll, I'll maybe fly to a conference or we'll drive to Orlando for three hours and then I'll I'll maybe head over to the West Coast and, and go there for a bit. Then I'll go to Hawaii for a bit of leisure for, say, two to three days. So that's the way I try to do things. I try to, you know, mix it up and sort of mix business with pleasure because just to spend on, say, outright pleasure, just lying around doing nothing all the time. Again, that's just not for me. I could do that for maybe four days and then I've got to I've got to do something else. (laughs) Yeah, well, I don't like sitting on my bum either. I like experiences. I like learning. I like feeding my brain. And I really like doing stuff that's outside my comfort zone. So going to, uh, to Egypt and, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that was outside my comfort zone. I mean, there was a lot of comfort there too and cool stuff, but it was definitely outside my comfort zone. And I thrive in that sort of environment. I think it's good for your brain. So like to, just a to touch, not against that. And you're, you're so right. And again, anyone listening, if you feel a little kind of uneasy about it or it's not what you're used to, guess what? That's great. That's normal. Yeah. But to get ahead in life, you need to meet new people. You need to go to different places. You have to experience different cultures because there's a big world out there. And there's, I mean, it's an amazing world. There's, you know, so much abundance. And th- that's why I love when I, when I go around, you know, like the south of France or something. And, you know, my friend, you know, picked me up and, you know, we drove around the, the hills and he showed me like the mansions and, the, you know, just the general lifestyle and, and, the, and the beauty and the scenery. It's just so inspiring to see you know, the world that we live in, there's there's so many great things out there. And, and you're meant to challenge yourself. You're meant to go and do new things. It, that's irrespective of money or anything. That's just part of growing and expanding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, so we're running short on time. So I wanted to switch to lightning round mode, all right? And for okay. this, I just want you to answer as quickly as you can. I'm going to give you a bunch of different questions. Basically, I'm going to compare one thing to another and you tell me, which one's better, or which one you'd recommend to our listeners. Okay, ready to go? Ready, yep. SaaS versus info marketing, like if, if you are creating uh, a product. That depends on your skill level. I Are you a technical person, or do you have content or something that you br- think you can bring to the community? Well, let's say that it's somebody who has the ability to bring a technical person on board. Yeah, well, that's if they understand marketing or learn how to market, Bringing the developer on board is definitely an option. Absolutely. So do you think a SaaS would be a better option for somebody because of the recurring revenue and the ability to, to lock somebody in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay. All right. I concur with you on that one. Build the product first and then sell it or sell the product first and then build it? I would say build a working, I'll, I'll be careful there, don't think that the product has to be perfect and don't think it has to be um build a version one of the product that that way you can test the market in fact that's how we we grew one of our companies zappable was we didn't just build this thing from pure scratch we released like a a version of it under a different it was actually a different name it only had like six features and then we released like beta access to it charged a monthly fee and then used that cash flow to reinvest and grow it awesome all right. Yeah, I think you mentioned that, was it on James Shramko's podcast, talking about pre-selling the product? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's another great way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. ClickBank versus JVZoo. Again, what are you looking to sell? JVZoo at the minute in terms of, if you go to JVZoo and you go to, I think it's top sellers and look at top sellers in the last 30 days, there's a very high emphasis on video products, i.e. products that can create your own video animation or, you know, create Instagram story ads, things like that there. So if you're doing like software, video-based, JVZ definitely at the moment. Uh, ClickBank, I haven't studied as much at the moment, so I'm not really able to comment on that. But but within the JVZ, software is definitely good to go there. All right, cool. Where do you see the biggest opportunity in terms of getting traffic and monetizing that traffic? Is it Facebook ads, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, or SEO? I would say, first of all, Google, Facebook, Instagram are definitely some huge traffic sources. But Stefan, there's a caveat to that. You need to be introducing a lead capture system and you need to be getting that data. Okay, 
and filtering them into different uh, communication mediums. So that same lead, you want to be in contact with them on, uh, you get their email address, drive them to maybe a Facebook group you host, and also get them inside your bot. So you have multiple ways of communicating with them. Awesome. And what's the best email system that you would recommend? Is it Aweber, Infusionsoft, MoroPost, something else? I've been with Aweber for about 13 years. Uh, like anything, it, it has its ups and downs, pros and cons. But overall, they've been quite a good system. I, this is an ongoing saga. Some people switch to a new autoresponder. They love it for like a month or half a year and then deliverability turns and then they go to the next email provider and the same story. So I've been with Aweber and they've been consistently pretty good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. We need to wrap. Where should we send our listeners to to learn more about you, to work with your various tools and information products and maybe even join your mastermind? Okay. So if you want to get into the opportunity of, of maybe creating your own mobile apps and, and selling them, uh, go to zappable.com. You can uh, find out about that there. If you would like to learn how to, the formula that I've used to sell over $7 million um, of info products, recurring products and software, if you head to gofoxy.com, I'm bringing out a, a new product called Hyper Funnel Formula, which is a five, six-week training course. Uh, it'll walk you through step-by-step step of how to do this. There'll also be a membership club as well. I am just deciding the name off. I'm thinking of calling it the Fast Lane. So that are the, sorry, they're the products I have on offer at the moment. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Andrew. This was a lot of fun. And boy, there was so much more I wanted to go over. We'll have to have you back on, uh, to do another uh, episode sometime if, if you're game. <laughs> I really enjoyed it, Stefan. And you asked some interesting questions. And I, I loved your, um, you know, because I know you're a, a technically savvy guy. So it's, it's interesting to hear your take on the on the AI and, and obviously the exponential growth and everything. It, it was really, really interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. All right, so thank you again, Andrew. Thank you, listeners, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode of Marketing Speak. In the meantime, go out there and implement. Thanks for listening to the Marketing Speak podcast. Your host has been Stefan Spencer, three-time author and leading expert on SEO and online marketing, whose client list boasts such brands as Zappos, Sony, and Chanel. Want to learn more about SEO, social media, or just generally how to build an online empire? Visit marketingspeak.com for an archive of past episodes, along with transcripts and show notes. In addition, a wealth of resources that include video-based training, screencasts, webinars, white papers, articles, and blog posts can be found on his SEO coaching site, scienceofseo.com. To reach Stefan, visit his personal website at stephanspencer.com or email him directly at stefan at stephanspencer.com. Until next time.